This is Port Stories, brought to you by the Ports Past and Present Project, sharing stories from five port towns in Ireland and Wales, Dublin, Rosslare, Hollyhead, Fishguard and Pembroke Dock, funded by the European Regional Development Fund through the Ireland-Wales Cooperation Programme. Hi everybody and welcome to the Port Stories podcast. I'm here this morning with my colleague Marianne Constantine from the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, the Centre for Advanced Welsh and Celtic Studies. And my name is Claire Connolly from University College Cork. And we have the great privilege this morning of speaking to Bernadette Donoghue, um, whom Marianne is going to introduce now. Thank you, Claire, and welcome, Bernard. Thank you very much. Bernadette Donoghue was born in Cullen, County Cork, in 1945 and moved to Manchester in 1962, then on to Oxford where he still lives. He's an Emeritus Fellow of Wadham College where he taught medieval English and modern Irish poetry. He's published numerous collections of poetry, including Gunpowder, winner of the 1995 Whitbread Prize for Poetry, and in 2016, The Seasons of Cullen Church. He's also a translator from Old and Middle English publishing a verse translation of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and on Piers Plowman. He's been praised for his expert lyric poems and their generous yet understated control of voice. Many of these poems draw on characters and stories from his childhood in County Cork. Bernard has spent a great deal of time travelling between Oxford and Ireland and is therefore no stranger to the port towns and the ferry crossings at the heart of our project. Welcome, Bernard. Thank you very much, Miriam. So Bernard, as you know, our project is about trying to kind of uncover the longer history of these sea crossings and, mm. uh, you know, from the Vikings onwards, people have been uh, making their way across the, this stretch of narrow water between Ireland and Britain. But your own history and experience in, in the modern period, if you like, still will have seen changes mm. and uh, transitions know not just in technology and transport but in other kinds of cultural ways and so on so I was just wondering would you tell us just a, a little bit about the times you've encountered the crossing the ways you've crossed that your experiences on the ferries that kind of thing yeah um well as Marianne said in the introduction um in 1962 I moved to live in England so I, I became a, it's a different sort of crossing thereafter because up to that point um, I was growing up in Ireland with a, a mother from Manchester, and she was of Irish origin and so on, but, uh, but she'd grown up in Manchester. So um, uh, we, tra we travelled from, from Ireland, um, mostly from um, Dublin to Liverpool uh, on BNI. Um, uh, at, so we were going to Manchester as the holiday destination. You know, so, and, uh, and of course that whole polarity changed in 1962 when I... Um, when I Step, you know, I was living in England thereafter, so um, and going going the other way, so to speak. You know, um, the first one I remember, the first crossing I remember, was in a, a very very um, uh, pre-modern um, experience, which was on the the ship called the Ken Mare. You know, not to be confused, of course, with the ship that was um, that was sunk in 1918. But um, it was a, it, it really was a very kind of basic ship. It was at a time when. On the front page of the Irish, the Cork Examiner every day, there was an advertisement for the Innes Fallon crossing to Fishguard. And that looked very kind of grand and spelt, you know, compared to the, the Kenmare. It took a long time, of course, as well, to go from Cork to Liverpool and back. I think that was about 1952. But as I said, thereafter, um, until 1962, it was uh, mostly uh, Dublin, Liverpool by, by BNI. And when the when you'd see the advert on the front of the Irish Examiner or whatever, so that would be to tell you what time the crossing was going and to it would be sort of a a daily event then, Bernard, or yes, weekly? Yes, or? daily. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and of course until rather late on, uh, the mail boat, you know, the the the, the boat crossed twice a day. I mean, they took the post twice a day from. Uh, from Dunlera to Holyhead and, and back. I always think it's funny the way we talk about the mail boat and we think of the mail boat when, yeah. of course, it was also carrying lots of people. Uh, yeah. Yes, <laughs> um, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so people and the post. Yes, yeah. 
um, once I was making a very bad job of parking my car in UCC and I was witnessed by somebody, I was trying to get into an incredibly narrow space. Cork writer uh, Conal Creedon happened to be passing and he said, well, he said, it's like the turning of the Inish Fallon, which <laughs> was, apparently yes. for a generation of Cork people was what they would watch was the kind of the, the, the large ship, as you say, yes. this large sleek vessel trying to get, turn around at the top of the, uh, at the top of the river at the city yeah. Yeah, and get back around. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. I mean, yeah, it's very, very small turning circle. It was about six foot clear on both yeah. ends. <laughs> the world was extraordinary, really. Um, I remember that, that that was another of the routes to cross was um, uh, coming coming into Cork. I mean, as with the Camera, I suppose. But uh, I remember when the Cork Swansea ferry was running um, for quite a long time. It came right up to the uh, right up to the middle of the city, up to Laviski, didn't it? Um, I remember once um, uh, coming in on, on that stretch under Montenotti, and um, I was reading by chance, The House in Paris by Elizabeth oh. Bowen. And she was actually describing the scene, I, I've never had that experience otherwise, but as I was looking at it, I could see <laughs> yeah. the houses she was talking about in the, on the page, you know. She's, so, um, uh, in the novel there, she's describing it from someplace around Rushbrook or Cove, isn't she? Right, I think right, looking, right. looking that's down right. and there's a, a very memorable line where she says there, the character says, the harbour is good company. Oh, yes, oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, wasn't that? Yes, mm. yes. But, uh, and so, Bernard, when would you have, um, presumably, you know, the Cork route um, didn't continue or it, it fell away and then it restarted at different points? Yeah, yeah. And at what point would you have, would you have started traveling through Wales or would that have become more part of the your route? Yeah, but it already was really from, uh, I lived in Oxford, as Mary Ann said, since 1965, you know, um, first as a student and then just living here. Um, and of course, the, um, Travelling by kind of by the sort of cheapest method, really, was um, what, was what we did sometimes by the mail boat, but um, but mostly just along the along the south. I mean, it's a curious geographical fact that the nearest port to Oxford is Liverpool. Mm. So logically, in a way, you should go to Liverpool to to Dublin still, but but we never do that. We go straight across the bottom, so to speak. We go through across South Wales, which is the route that we know very very well indeed, really. And across the south of Ireland, you know, the, the Comra Mountains and so on. So it's, it's a lovely trip, you know. Um, and that we know every, every turn of the road really around the both sides there, really. I bet. Um, sometimes I've, when I've made that journey myself, I've with uh, my husband Paul, we've played the game of you know Ireland or Wales at different points. Yeah. When once you get into West Wales, how would you know now if you were in Ireland or Wales? Yes. So when I first read your poem, Westering Home, it was a real flash of recognition for that exact yes, yes. thing of trying to figure out, you know, how, how do you yes. know where you are? Um, yes. And those, I'm, those. I'm just going to jump in here because I've got the first couple of, um, a couple of lines here mm. for you, yes. which I thought would be nice and, and to ask a little bit about Wales as well. Though you'd be pressed to say exactly where it first sets in, driving west through Wales, things start to feel like Ireland. And that's the opening of Bernard's poem, Westering Home, which evokes a Welsh landscape that's obviously neither here nor there. It's neither Oxfordshire nor County Cork. <laughs> and that journey home west through, through Wales by car with the motorway rather wonderfully losing its nerve mile by mile. And it really does do that. And I have to say, when I'm driving that motorway west, I start to relax as the road gets yeah. smaller and bumpier yeah. and, and windier. And, yeah. and it's the feeling that, you know, you're, you're heading into a known space. It's wonderful. Yes. But how, I was thinking about how, is that part of the experience of negotiating the gap that you talk about between the two, two places? The landscapes of North Wales and the Welsh language crop yeah. up in your poems as well. Yeah. You, you encounter them in and from trains, uh, notably yeah. the train to Bangor in, in The Rainmaker. Yeah. And of course, you see whales from the ferries viewed from the deck, if you happen to be up on deck. And mm. I, I work on 18th century tours of Wales, mm. and I'm always really fascinated by what travellers through places see and feel and think, as well as the things that they don't see. And, and I often wonder how your perception is shaped actually by the mode of transport you're in, the difference between driving, between being on a train, between walking even. Um, as well as all those other factors like light, mm. weather, 
and your own state of mind. So I wondered if you, you could tell us a little bit about Wales as a place that's defined for you by journeys, by the fact that it's the place you travel through. That's really interesting. Um, as well, I first met it through Holly Head, you know, the, the, tra the, the other end of the mailboat trip, as it were, you know, and travelling on through Wales by train from, from there. But actually, when I, when I lived in Manchester, the school in Manchester in the 1960s, um, I used to go with my cousins to, to a house in Anglesey um, every summer for a few years, you know, a place um, the, the north of Anglesey around Church Bay, those places. And really loved it. I got a quite a strong sense of, of Wales as being different. It was very other, you know, from Manchester as the starting point, and from Ireland as I knew it really. So, um, yeah, um, first of all, going to Wales by, by train, that's right. Um, there'd be the two main sort of sort of modes, really. As you say, it's a very different kind of kind of experience, really. Um, because on the, on the train, you're, you're able to encounter somebody else getting on and getting off, and you yes. see him reading, reading the book of, of poems yeah. in Welsh. And that's a kind of cultural encounter that you can't have when you're in a car, um, yes. traveling with your family through to a ferry port and across. I think this is something we think about quite a lot on the project is, mm. I've often sat in a car, in a ferry port, in a queue, waiting to get a ferry. And, and you're in a kind of, you're in your own bubble, aren't you? You're in your own yes, world. Yes, yes. I suppose something about the train connections, wherever yes. I've caught a ferry that's involved getting off a train and onto a ferry, you're, you're put into conjunction with a whole group of people you've never met before, yes. squashed yes. onto a bus and then bust across this extraordinary space of containers and weirdness yes. onto a ferry and then you never speak to them again. But yes. it, there's those, those wonderful kind of differences, I suppose, in yes. modes of travel. Yes, yes, that's that's very evocative. That's true. That's true. And the car as bubble, of course, is a very, mm. um, is a very sort of striking thing, isn't it? I mean, you know, the, the car stops you really experiencing or encountering um, um, anything else much, doesn't it? Um, One thing I learned at the start of this project when we were um, talking to some people in Fishguard was the existence of a Viking fish trap just beneath the um, the place where the cars line up in fish guards, you know, and if, mm. and I wondered, I thought, how had I never seen that before? It's so remarkable. Of mm. course, you only see it when the tide is out and the, oh, right. uh, yeah. <laughs> generally, right. uh, but it was remarkable to me to think that in this place where I had so often sat yes. with just vaguely wondering would I buy a coffee or not. Yes, kind of, yes, yes, yes. That, and then there's, the, you know, on our on our website, there's this beautiful photograph of the Viking fish trap, which you can see at low, at low tide, right there, you know, at your feet, kind of. Yeah. Would do you normally cross Fishguard or Pembroke Dock when you were going by? I was, I was afraid to ask that, Marianne. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you have to always, say you go to both equally. <laughs> well, we actually, we must go to Pembroke Dock. Really, we just got into the into the mm. way, partly actually for bird watching rather kind of pretentiously because I mean they've got they've got a kind of guide to the birds on those those wonderful islands you know that you go past um going out from Pembroke Dock which you don't um with Fishguard I think Fishguard is too far north is it but uh, there's uh, um the, the, those gannet gannetries and so on oh, um, which is the so you can, so you would you would watch from the deck when you're leaving. Yeah, then. yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Right. And it's about three, about three quarters of an hour out. You know, it's quite a way out to see it. So it is a big thing, really. But you, we just got into the way of it. We can buy Irish ferries yeah. out. And, and there's that wonderful yeah. sweep down the river as the river. It's a huge, huge expanse, isn't it? Yes. Of, yes. It always feels like being on the continent. I think um, yes. it's like a big German river or something that. It is it very is. surprising, a very surprising bit of geography, I always feel. Yeah, um, amazing, yeah. yeah, yeah, amazing. They, in, it's interesting in Pembroke Dock, the contrast between the natural geography and that kind of, and the built environment. It's so kind of military and almost imperial, yes, isn't it, yes, when you come into yeah, Pembroke Dock? It it's amazing, yeah, it is. It and is. the oil refineries on the on the left as you, you go down as well. Yeah, the industry yeah. is very potent. Yeah. 
to go back to what Marianne was saying about trains, I suppose, um, or as Thomas's memories of Yates whilst travelling to Hollyhead has to be one of oh, the great yes, Irish yes. Welsh encounters, doesn't yes. it? Yes, yes, yes. Of, yes. Uh, po possible meeting on a possible imagined train trip. Yes, yes. Trains across have a kind of uh, excitement potential that nothing else has really, for various yeah. reasons really. Mm. Yeah, I've really missed that this year. I've missed the yeah. journey out of yeah. Aberystwyth up the coast yes. where the bay opens out is something something I really regret about other I mean otherwise I'm very happy at the minute kind yes. of the whole, but, uh, yes. the yeah. yeah yeah I remember being very unnerved when Mrs Thatcher said that she didn't like trains ah. and I thought you know what sort of person doesn't like trains you know, <laughs> everybody likes trains you know. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Talking of birds then, um, birds have quite a part to play in your poem about Rosslare, don't they? Yes, um, yes. I was wondering maybe if, if, if now would be a good moment to, re to read the poem and tell us, perhaps, tell us a little yeah. bit about how this poem came to be. And, um, yeah. um, I think one of, one of the the features of, the, of these journeys, you know, um, is, is repetition. You know, you, you, you live, to, it's like um, what Claire, Claire and Paul were saying about, you Claire, about, Claire was saying about her and Paul, you know, so, um, uh, you know, testing points along the way, really. Um, you get to, to know these routes incredibly well, and you go through the same procedures all the time, really. Um, sometimes you only discover that by looking at, at diaries, you know, you find that you, um, you did exactly the same thing at the same time time two years ago and three years ago and so on um so uh, um the, the, the poem is just talking about uh, as you drive from from north cork from cullen in north cork um to cork city and across the south coast um to rosslare past Tom garvey and so on um uh, this extremely familiar and very, you know, very beautiful um uh, road journey um i mentioned already the the the, the road at the, at the south of the Comoros, you know, between the Comoros Mountains and the sea. It's a really wonderful um, uh, trip, really, but you, you've got to, you get over familiar with because it's, um, because you, you know it so well, really. Um, so this is just kind of stage posts along the way, really. Um, Heather, my wife, is, is um, more of a bird watcher than me, really. She's extremely keen, so we tend to kind of stop off anywhere we are to to just kind of fix the binoculars on the birds, you know. <laughs> so, yes. but in fact, I think actually the when we came to um, came to Ireland after um, immediately after getting married in 1977, we got off the boat at um, Rosslair and went to that. Beach. It's an extraordinary thing, this beautiful sandy beach, which is mm. just underneath the um, the ferry port, which is very kind of remarkable. And it's, it's a beautiful it's, spot, yeah. It really is. It's amazing. Yeah, looking out towards the Tusker Rock and so on. Mm. And will you read the poem for us, Bernard? Okay, well, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Sanderling at Rosslair for Claire and Paul. The standard procedure is to fill up with petrol just past the long scenic sweep down into Dungarvan, to drop the bags at the Rosslair Lodge and drive to the beach behind the ferry port where our boat is all business, preparing to set off. It will reach Wales and then cross back for us to embark in the morning. As the twilight deepens, the on-off of the Tusker light finds its range. We're watching a stone chest swaying precariously on its perch. At the water's edge, a small flock of sanderling is pattering to and fro, letting us almost catch up then shrilling off in a sparkling V of flight to settle on a new ridge of sand 50 yards ahead. Having escaped us, they run to the sea, which in turn runs at them, so they double back. This is where they live. It's where they will be when we next start out from the same perfect point of departure. Thank you so Lovely. much for yeah reading it. Beautiful. There's really something, and and um, I thank you for the dedication as well, Bernard. It's mm -hmm. sincerely appreciated. Mm -hmm. There's something there about those lines at the end about when we next start out that expresses mm -hmm. the kind of 
enduring nature of these journeys. Yes. You, you were talking about them earlier on in terms of habit and custom, custom and practice and so on. Mm. And probably seems impertinent to ask, having just heard you read, but are there any other writers whom for you um, help us to kind of see these enduring connections or think through and think about the nature of the sea crossings between Ireland and Wales? Yeah, um, well, as, as well as the Oris Thomas poem you mentioned, you know, there's um, um, uh, C.D. Lewis's um, Fish Girl to Ross Lair is a, is, is a kind of masterpiece, I think, really. I think what that really captures as well is the, there's something kind of um, um, twilight about it all, you know, I mean, at this point, which is well, really, you're always on, on the point of doing, doing something else, you know, like going somewhere else. So there's um, a, a, a sort of mar marginal feel to it all, really. Mm. Um, so the, the um, and of course, it's a very strange thing to do because, um, I mean, just to show here, literally, what you do, you, you, the boat is there, ready to go on the previous crossing. And uh, but when you arrive there, so you watch it setting off as you will be um, the next day and stay overnight. It's just a way of uh, breaking the journey, really. But there's something very odd about that, I think. Um, mm. a, a bit like the, the birds running to the sea and then running back from the sea. Yeah, and, uh, but, um, yeah it's marking time, passing time, all, all these yeah. things together. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. I also like the fact that the birds live there and you're passing yeah. through. Mm. Whereas yes. we think we think of birds as things that that fly through our lives, that fly through the feasting hall, that that, that are transient. Yes. But in fact, here yes. we are the transient ones, and it's the yep. birds who have their little their routines, their patterns, their their little feet on the sand. Um, yes. Yeah, I think that's a that's a very vivid, and and actually very evocative from our point of view because in, in the project we're always thinking about what it's like to to be and to live in a place mm. that sees people passing through it on a daily basis and, and yes. how that affects the, the rhythm and the tide, if you like, of, of their commerce, of their cultural lives and, and the pattern of their days. When you live in a port town and you see the ferry come in and come mm. out, mm. that's a regular thing for them. That's, that's like a, a, a part of the, the heartbeat of the town, I suppose. Yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And of course, it's, it's it is a great kind of marker of time. I mean, like the, op the opening scene of, uh, of Ulysses, you know, with um, Haynes looking out at the mailboat, you know, um, from from the Marcello Tower, and the Ginger Man, Don Lee's Ginger Man, is uh, the, the the mailboat's a major presence in that as well, really. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're like they're like sort of clocks, aren't they? Really, if, if you yeah. live there, I suppose, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, this is slightly different, but I was very struck by something that Cahill Dallas, who's a, who's a London-based Irish writer, you know, uh, he said a few years ago that he'd just been talking to somebody in, this, in December, and they said to him, are you going home for Christmas, or are you staying at home? <laughs> That's Which lovely. I kind of captured really something nice. about, you know, the... Um, yeah. 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 Between two homes, really. Yeah, yeah two, and the two different senses of the word, in a way. Aren't they? Yeah. I mean, uh, it is, yeah, yeah. Well, thank, thank you very, you much. very much. Well, thank you very much. It's been lovely. Thank you. Yeah, very really much. enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Me too. Thank you very much. <laughs>